Good evening and welcome to um, a Monday evening event. We don't do these quite so regularly, but it gives me great pleasure to wait and welcome uh, you this evening to an event entitled What is a Matix with Professor Oveymar Anjum. Um, the question of a Matix uh, may sound unfamiliar, um, partly because it's a recently coined term. The term omatics comes um, from Professor Oveymar Anjum's dissertation, which he wrote in 2008, and is a portmanteau, or combined word, combining the words ummah, uh, or the Muslim uh, sort of community, and politics. Um, and as I'm sure he'll elaborate further, um, the notion of politics comes from a Greek heritage, which centred the polis, or the city, as the locus of uh, political action. Um, whereas in the Islamic tradition, or so Professor Omar Anjum is arguing, uh, the locus of that engagement in the political takes place by centering the ummah. So who is Professor Omar Anjum? Um, Omar and uh, I go back a fair bit actually through his book, which was published in 2012 uh, with Cambridge University Press and entitled Politics, Law and Community, The Taymiyyan Moment. Um, he is the Imam Khattab Endowed Chair of Islamic Studies at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Toledo in Ohio. Uh, his work focuses on the nexus of theology, ethics, politics, law uh, and law in Islam or as uh, Dr. Farhan Nizami of the Center for Islamic Studies said this afternoon, what's left? Um, with a comparative interest in Western thought. Trained as a historian, uh, his work is essentially interdisciplinary, uh, drawing on fields of classical Islamic studies, political philosophy, and cultural anthropology. He obtained his PhD in Islamic intellectual history at the Department of History uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, his Master's in Social Sciences from the University of Chicago, and his Master's in Computer Science and his Bachelor's in Nuclear Engineering and Physics from the University of Madison, uh, Wisconsin and Madison. Um, so a person who has uh, a couple of different careers, I suspect. Before higher education, his Islamic training began at home while growing up in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the United States with a broad range of scholars, including his remarkable grandmother, and he continued his studies of fiqh with South Asian Hanafi and Ahli Hadith scholars uh, and usul al-fiqh, or uh, the roots of jurisprudence, and qira'at, or the variant readings of the Qur'an, uh, with scholars from Egypt's al-Azhar and Syria. Um, as mentioned, he's the author of Politics, Law and the Community in Islamic Thought, The Taymiyyan Moment, published by Cambridge University Press in 2012, uh, and he has translated Madarij al-Salikin, an encyclopedic work on, uh, of spirituality, uh, translated as Ranks of the Divine uh, Seekers by Brill in 2020, um, two volumes out, and I believe another two volumes in process, um, which is by uh, the noted and prolific uh, Damascene scholar Ibn Qayyim al, -Jaw Ibn -Qayyim al jawziyah who died in 1351. Um, this is one of the greatest Islamic spiritual classics and has, uh, and this work is the largest single author English translation of an Arabic text. His current project uh, or projects include a survey of Islamic history and a monograph on Islamic political thought. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Oveymar Anjum to speak about what is ummatics. Can everybody hear me back there? Okay, excellent. So let me begin by thanking profusely um, Dr. Osama al Azami himself, who is instrumental in my being here, and Professor Eugene Rogan, um, and the Middle East Center at St. Anthony's College here, who have uh, very graciously invited me, um, and to all of you for being here this evening. 
My topic today is what is omatics? Can Muslims think qua Muslims? Can Muslim think as Muslims? So let me begin. In 1831, in a landmark case, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, United States Chief Justice Marshall argued that the Cherokee Nation should be regarded not as a foreign nation, but as a domestic dependent nation. By this he meant they are in a, they are in a state of pupillage. Their relationship to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. The Indians are under our pupillage because our conquest and the demise of the hunt, hunting and warrior life that were part of the land. The buffalo is no more, but so too the means of existence that were part of that nomadic life. In his hauntingly beautiful book, Radical Hope, University of Chicago professor, philosopher Jonathan Lear meditates on the profound vulnerability of the Indians specifically the Crow Nation. The real vulnerability was not of need or dependency, but of cultural devastation. The rituals, the practices, the meaning of a way of life, more than just the means for living, have been annihilated by, the circum by circumstance and conquest. Radical hope is a study, that's the name of the book, is a study of the death of um, the representative character of a people, of virtue, courage, resilience, and hope in the face of cultural collapse. Am I doing everything right? The leading questions are shaped by Professor Jonathan Lear's primary subject matter, ancient Greek ethics, what Lear wants to learn from the Crow nation is an account of what, in such an event, counts for us as good living, and what is the nature of the virtues or excellences that constitute it. How does a nation go on when the concepts and way of life it has lived, for, lived by for centuries are no more. What does it mean to go on? On the flip side of this, what does it mean to stop when the marks of going on are no longer? These are also the questions that have faced the Muslim Ummah for nearly a century. Professor Jonathan Lear's book, let us remember, is a sympathetic account of the death of a people's character, culture, spirit, and a way of life. Told by someone who belongs to the triumphant tribe, in this case the United States. An account related admiringly of a chief wanting to live on in some way. What got young Jonathan Lear started on this journey to understand the culture of coping with defeat was a lecture by a remarkable American historian, an icon of environmental history in the United States, someone who taught at my own alma mater, University of Wisconsin-Madison at some point, William Cronin, who had in one lecture once related the following words of a Crow chief named Plenty Coup. Here are the words. When the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground. And they could lift them, they could not lift them up again. After this, nothing happened. The end. What did Chief Plantiku mean when he said nothing happened? He lived a full life as an award-winning farmer in the United States, advocating his people's rights. He was not, Jonathan Lear reminds us, depressed, despondent, or neurotic. Yet he belonged to a culture and measured his life by a set of virtues and practices that had disappeared. 
Not only did the practices of the great buffalo hunt and the communal life that sustained it disappear, but that culture and its virtues became incoherent and incomprehensible. The young crow generation would not grow up to measure their lives by those virtues, or even admire those who possessed them, or even know what those virtues were. Yet, Jonathan Lear wants, us to, wants to tell us Chief Plenticu lived on with radical hope, not to recover his way of life and meaning, but as a poet of sorts. Lear says, what would be required, thinking about both the Crow Nation, but also, in this case, meditating on a lost culture, perhaps, uh, of, of to which he belongs, a, 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 a culture, um, United States. Um, what would be required, he asks, would be a new Crow poet, one who could take up the Crow past and rather than use it for nostalgia or irsatz my, my ceases, uh, mimesis, project it into vibrant new ways for the crow to live and to be. So Lear's radical suggestion then is to project the past without nostalgia, but with creativity and hope into the future, write poems. Let us explore the insights we might learn about the struggle of Islam from this analogy, is the Sharia today really more comprehensible, more meaningful, and are Islamic virtues more vibrant and lively today than the cultures of the lost crow? Some poignantly, poignant scholarly voices today have suggested that the answer is in the negative. Anthropologist Talal Asad in his subtle and suggestive works, which now have a wide and multidisciplinary audience, an Islamic legal historian of Palestinian Christian descent uh, and my friend Wael Halak, in a, more careful, in a more forceful and direct way, have argued that not only the practices, institutions, and bodies of knowledge, but also the epistemic and psychological conditions that made sense of the Sharia have been obliterated by the colonial and particularly post-colonial experience. This loss was symbolized, but only symbolized by the loss of the Ottoman Caliphate a century ago. Of course, the erosion had begun much earlier. The great Ottoman Scholar Mustafa Sabri, in fact, writes about this loss in precisely the same terms almost as Plentiku, about that culture at the end of the Ottoman Empire. South Asian philosopher poet Muhammad Iqbal, in his epic defining poem, Shikwa and then Jawabi Shikwa, Shikwa was a Muslim's complaint to God, and Jawabi Shikwa was the response. God's response, depicted this sense of loss. To quote from Jawab Shikwa, Waize qom ki wo pukhta khayali na rahi, barke tabai na rahi, shola makali na rahi, reh gai rasme azan, ruhe bilali na rahi, falsafa reh gaya, talqeen ghazali na rahi, masjid marsiya khahe ki namazi na rahi, yani wo sahibe au safi hijazi na rahi. Your preachers are no longer ripe in their judgment, nor electrifying at heart, nor fiery in speech. Azan yet sounds but absent Bilal's soul. Philosophy there is but without Ghazali's conviction. Your mosques lament their emptiness, for gone are those exemplars of Arab godliness. This excerpt from Jawabi Shikwa God's answer to the Indian Muslim's prayer shows something quite audacious, perhaps what Lear would call Iqbal's radical hope. Iqbal's judgment was not that of an Asad or Halak, nor his response one of plenty coup, in fact. 
After this, nothing happened. But rather, his response was to make God renew his response, his promise in a new response. Because what is remarkable is that shikwa is not it. It is only a setup for jawab shikwa A century later today, his words remain sadly pertinent. Although well-worn and ritualized as if part of a loved one's obituary, they conceal much more, as I will suggest. Against this backdrop, let me turn to the question of how Muslims can think as Muslims. For themselves and about themselves, about their past and future in a way that makes any coherent sense, a sense that is not borrowed, or at least borrowed um, to not to the point that the original message is nothing but the borrowing, in a way that Muslims' political aspirations and moral vocabulary and social practices make their own sense, not merely markers of identity as the cuisines we love. Or to use Lear's words, Irsad's mimesis, a fake imitation, lest we think that I've exaggerated too much by drawing the analogy of the ummah of nearly two billion people with that of the Crow Nation. Let us recall the unironic title of a book by Professor Jonathan Lawrence of Boston College, a book that just came out, I believe, in 2020. Um, the book is called Coping with Defeat, Sunni Islam, Roman Catholicism and the Modern State. The book is a virtuoso performance of a political scientist written with the same sympathy and insight as Lear's book about the crow and about the crow's cultural death. And with almost the same message, how Muslims need to accept and cope with defeat. Against this backdrop of an epical loss and the possibility of radical hope in its wake, I now proceed to explore how Muslims have responded to this loss and why thinking politically as Muslims, thinking umatically that is, is the only possible way to recover from that loss. Let us first ask, is it an exaggeration that nearly 2 billion Muslims in 50 some Muslim majority states face an extinction of meaning, a cultural death like that of the Crow Nation or the Native Americans at large? Is Halak, Professor Weil Halak, right that the Islamic State is impossible? Um, and as, as the rejuvenation of the Sharia he argued in an earlier article before the 2012 book, um, is also impossible, although he has perhaps changed his opinion, opinion on that in the book. What is needed to avoid the cultural death, the civilizational extinction, the, the irrelevance of meanings and virtues that Muslims find in their books, their scripture, their texts, their poems? To resolve the puzzle, if you will, to show Professor Halak to be wrong, as it were, and to demonstrate that Muslims can think as Muslims, we must think as Muslims. This is the dilemma, the circularity. It is an act of will rather than an argument that is necessary. One response may be that Professor Halak is just wrong in the very premise of his claim, either because Islam requires no epistemic conditions or that Islam is universal and rational, and hence its logic Im immediately accessible to all humans in any condition. But this reason will not do, if only because a patient of dementia may be logical without being themselves, without being fully functional adults. This is precisely what the example of the Crow Nation impresses upon us. One may live on as biomass without living with fullness of virtue, beauty, depth, meaning. 
In fact, precisely because neither memories nor desires will leave us as humans, the only way for us to live with forgiveness, hope, and wisdom rather than anguish, anger, and revenge, either directed at the the colonizer, the oppressor, the conqueror, or at each other far more frequently, we must overcome the dementia. Let us consider the response to Halak's challenge. Uh, Let's consider another response to Halak's challenge, namely that Western colonialism and cultural and intellectual hegemony have not really caused that kind of rupture being claimed. The destruction of Muslim institutions, of learning, of culture, family, and appending of Muslim traditions, of literature, politics, and social existence, and the cutting up of the Muslim lands into 50-some nation states, foreign institutions with no indigenous roots, and constant attempts by these often Orwellian, Orwellian states to recreate Muslim subjects into their image, None of this has in fact caused a total irreparable damage. The Muslims are still, one might say, not in the same place as the crow. This response is the one that I I characterize as one of sheer will, one that requires audacious hope rather than a decisive argument, for there can be none. We should also note that contrary to Halak, some argue that perhaps it is the case that modernity has in some respects been a blessing in disguise and has illuminated aspects of Islam and offered opportunities to Muslims to grow and become properly Muslim and improve over the decadent and hollowed out Muslim civilization of the pre-colonial period, a world that had become colonizable before it became colonized, to use the words of the Algerian Muslim thinker Malik bin Nabi. I don't quite know, in fact, how to conclude this section, so I will just move on. (laughs) Deracination of the world today. Where do we stand? Over the course of the 20th century, culminating in the age of globalization, The world hurled headlong into a liberal universalism, a capitalist utopia, a a monochromatic universe, a flat world run from the twin towers of the Silicon Valley and the Wall Wall Street that leveled all differences, that finished the job of Western hegemony started by the British Empire. Is this the world that we inhabit today? The East-West dichotomy, I argue, is gone. What is left now is the world, in the world is the West, and the West thrives on a north-south dichotomy. What I mean is that we no longer have a cultural clash of the West and others, the West and the East, or as Samuel Huntington would have it, the West versus the four, five, six other civilizations that the West must keep divided and conquered. In his important book, The Clash of Civilizations, that was his recommendation. But that distinction, I'm afraid, is gone in the world today. What we'd rather have is a unified, vulgar elite in every part of the world, from the Western core to India, China, and the Middle East, and the rest of it, all persuaded the joining aspects of the capitalist liberal West is the only way to survive. A few elites in every country have become billionaires and the masses of humanity everywhere are dispossessed, dispossessed not only of meaningful wealth and prospects, but of their humanity, of meaning, of respect, of virtue that they can understand. The world, so the thesis goes, has become deracinated. It is no wonder that the West itself has lost meaning and identity. It has conquered the world, and nothing is left to conquer. Yet, all the people of the world can now agree simultaneously with Francis Fukuyama and with Plenty Coup that history has ended, and, to quote, after that, nothing happened. The West is no longer an other. 
Its flaws are our flaws. Its triumphs are, well, sometimes ours. Not because we have enjoyed them or perpetrated them, the, flaw, the falls or the flaws or the triumphs, but, have, but having lost an alternative way of life, we would perhaps do the same if given the chance. And we have left little to celebrate, it seems, little else. Modern nihilism and loss of meaning has become the humanity's problem. American Muslims, to give an example of where I come from, the quick assimilation showcases this well, while keeping aspects of religion such as the prayer or the hijab or the halal meat and even certain social mores, our community is a testament to the fact that when deracinated, stripped of its power to effect or affect culture, law, and social life, Islam becomes accordingly truncated in its promise to give meaning and instill its characteristic virtues. Barely an island is left on this earth that hasn't been conquered, assimilated, monitored, watched, exploited, civilized, surveyed, and deracinated. But what now? The the conqueror has himself become disintegrated and deracinated. There is no meaning or satisfaction even in the talk of revenge. It dominates but does not know why, for it no longer knows why it lives and why it fights endless wars. Its warriors make towers after towers of skulls, but its poets do not celebrate the towers anymore. They do not know what the towers are for. The ecological calamity is a most apt metaphor for the world that we inhabit. Those who will lose their homes to floods, drought, sea level rise, are by far those who contributed to none of the global warming and reap none of the benefits of the frenzy of industrial and post-industrial development over the last two centuries. This is why, now I move to the second part of my talk, Muslims must start to think as Muslims, even as they think for and about the world. This is why the Muslim Ummah must start from its inner resources, from its own history and culture. Not in an isolationist way, because there is no isolation anymore. And not so much a rejection of the West, that's not really possible, but rather an embracing of collective selfhood of the past, present and future of Muslims, and only in that capacity embrace the world. Only then it is possible to both resist and forgive the designs of the current world order, the global war on terror that often slips into global war on Islam. Muslims have a choice between, on the one hand, becoming extinct as a civilization, a culture, a tradition, in short, as an ummah, and becoming mere biomass, inhabiting, when not in minorities and diaspora, a series of failed states of savage territories that the leaders of the brave new world will use to scare their own masses into frightened silence and sheepish solipsism. The other option is to think as an ummah again, and both thinking and thinking as are equally important parts of the proposal here. So then, what is ummatics? The term ummatics refers to all that pertains to the ummah, to the collective affairs of the Muslim community. Ummah is a term, of course, that is defined and honored in the Qur'an to refer to the community of the followers of the final prophet, Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, one that is declared the best community brought forth for humankind, ennobled by Allah as the most balanced community, ummatan wasatan, and that has been called to hold on to the rope of Allah altogether. And that has... Um, Rendered in the Prophet's own words, the Prophet uh, Ummatics in its nominal form translates to Siyasat al Ummah. The word Siyasa, of course, being a prophetic word um, used in reference to Israelites. Ummatics, accordingly, is the appropriate term for Islamic politics. As such, it is an umbrella term for the discourses, beliefs, and practices in which the Ummah 
and its divine mission are envisioned and expressed. Its solidarity is felt and its sociocultural, political, ethical and religious affairs are addressed and managed. Umatics is to Ummah what politics is to polis. Why coin a new term, umatics? Why not just speak of Islamic politics? Because words are crucial in both understanding and obscuring ideas. And as Muslims, taking charge of our language is a first step towards taking control of our destiny, of challenging the idea that nothing happened after that. Uh, coined by Aristotle, the word, pol- the word politics referred to the collective affairs of the city, polis, and the management of these affairs. Although in the modern period, politics is understood in reference to the modern territorial state. The term politics, therefore, does not quite capture what the Quran uh, and the Islamic discourse mean when speaking of fundamental Islamic matters, such as the imamate or the caliphate, governance of the ummah and rights and duties of the rulers and the ruled. Their discourse is not limited by territorial boundaries, national characteristics, and this worldly aspirations of a people, as politics is often concerned with, but rather defined by the mission, moral characteristics, and salvific quest of the ummah to fulfill its mission moral uh, to fulfill its mission this ummah must be governed by someone who functions in the capacity of the deputy says islamic tradition that deputy being the khalifa or the imam deputy of the prophet in so far as he manages the affairs of the ummah to recall the classical definition Khilafah is the deputyship of the Prophet in managing the affairs of this ummah by protecting its religion and worldly affairs. Etymologically, the word ummah refers to a collectivity or community that has a purpose or intention to which it is led by an imam. Notwithstanding their frequent secularization in the age of nationalism and the nation-state, Key concepts such as ummah or milla in Islamic discourse do not refer to territorial nations, to Pakistan or Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Nigeria or Malaysia, nor in fact even to humanity at large, nor to the people of the East, nor to the all oppressed, all the oppressed or colonized people of the world or the global South, as various movements have tried to um, uh, use, use, use it but to the Islamic Ummah, to the community comprised of all those who declare the two testimonies of faith. Reclaiming our language, therefore, is particularly important because many of today's Muslim-majority nation-states are Orwellian structures ruled by small coteries of elites, loyal only to their self-interest and the interest of their patrons and masters. These elites have tried over the last century to demoralize, brainwash, and de-Islamicize Muslims, at times outright massacring, uh, and other times corrupting our knowledge, culture, language. Note that on the one hand, the concern of umatics is not in contrast to secular politics, merely to manage and redistribute resources, but also to uphold the divine message and facilitate stewardship of the earth, manage intra-Muslim relations, pursuit of harmony, unity, and unification, and establish justice and prosperity for all people in a way that fulfills the divine mandate. In disciplinary terms, umatics incorporates numerous aspects of Islamic creed, creedal discourses, jurisprudence, ethics, and additional Islamic discourses that pertain to the collective to collective concerns of Muslims, qua Muslims, shu'un al-Muslimin or umur al-Muslimin. This includes 
the classic content, the contents of the classic uh, of classic genres such as al ahkam al sultaniya al-siyasa al sharia but also modern disciplines such as political politics, uh, uh, social sciences, and the humanities. On the other hand, omatics neither negates nor precludes conventional politics or social sciences or the humanities for that matter. It only orders and redirects politics in the same way that the Islamic notion of marriage, for instance, does not negate the customary local and cultural notions of marriage, but rather gives it particular form and purpose. Accordingly, although umatic solidarity is not delimited by territorial borders, it does not deny the significance of diversity among people, cultures, customs, and practices. Umatic universalism need not be a, univer- a zero-sum game vis-à-vis local and particularistic affiliations. Islam celebrates Some kinds of differences mitigate others and discourages and prohibits other kinds. Now, if this discourse sounds very strange to you, even though nearly every Muslim for, uh, and uh, even today, folks who inhabit the walls of the madrasa, still talk in those terms. Um, This is very much the symptom of the worlds we inhabit. So the discomfort one might feel at beginning a speech in the name of God or speaking of Muslims, the ummah, the khilafah, the jihad, the sharia, and things of the sort, is very much part of the programming uh, and, and, and part of the death of the culture whose virtues, whose norms, whose moral ideals are strange to our ears. And so the Umatic uh, um, project as a discourse and the institute, uh, Umatic's institute that uh, we have recently founded, <clears throat> aims to make it possible once again to speak of Umatic loyalties, responsibilities, politics, societies, virtues, and uh, see if we can go Iqbal's route rather than uh, that of plenty coups. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Avim Anjum. Um, if you'd like, you can stay there, or if you'd like, you can sit down, however you would prefer to do it. But we're going to open the floor for some questions and answers. Um, and uh, I'd also like to highlight that those of you who do have questions, um, the, uh, if you'd like to ask a question afterwards, please come and see me, because you might need to sign a release form just so that we can use that recording afterwards. All right, so if I can ask the gentleman in the front, uh, and then, if it's all right, the lady, and then the gentleman. So, please. Jazakallah Professor, for your, um, for your lecture. Um, I have a question and a bonus question, if I may. Um, so the first question I have is, so obviously we've started the lecture with this analogy to the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the native nations and the, des- the destruction of their cultural... Um, history was preceded by a kind of ecological um, destruction which you alluded to. So the physical removal of their source of survival, the buffalo, um, preceded the kind of cultural destruction. So um, would you say that there is an analogy? Is there is there an equivalent of the buffalo in our um, mind or in our culture that's been destroyed? Is there one thing that we need to you know reintroduce, you know, rewild, as they say? Um, uh, or is it a combination of, of, of factors? Um, and secondly, um, who is, uh, obviously you have this institution, the Omatics Institution, but um, in thinking of these problems and in arriving at this new way of thinking, who, who, which group of people is better suited at doing that? Is it those um, nurtured in the West, this hotbed of imperialism, or is it, is it those under the, under the kosh of these um, autocratic Muslim nations? Oh, excellent. Both brilliant questions. So my short answer 
is that... So let me start with the second question. Who is better suited? You see, part of the challenge, as I, you know, as I alluded to in my presentation, the West is no longer... The West is no longer a confident unity. And that's part of my reference there is that it's no longer clear why, uh, what the West is. In other words, after conquering the world, it's not clear what the, who the other is. And therefore, I don't think that the discourse on colonialism anti-colonialism, post-colonialism, decoloniality quite captures either the reality or the possibilities outside uh, that are available to us. In other words, you're just in uh, as, as, as good of a, a place to think um, as those who are being crushed. But knowing people who are being crushed very much personally, myself, uh, I know that that the crushing is so successful is that people do not have the luxury, time, freedom to think. So it falls on us. Um, the, those that are doing that thinking, we must reach out, we must bring them, uh, uh, give them the mic, if you will. But... I don't think that there is, if 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 you will allow me a little bit of Marxist terminology, right? It's always internal contradictions of a system that uh, allow a a system of privilege to to be replaced or to be questioned. This was true of 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 anti-colonial struggle. Um, and this is true, fairly standard inside of social movement theory, that it is always the, um, the cracks within the elite structures that allow um, a different kind of possibilities to emerge. So I don't invest a lot of stock in um, the talk of anti-Westernism or decoloniality, even though I'm very sympathetic. I just don't think that they have really done anything other than, um, unless you think of a a true alternative that is not concerned primarily with opposition. It's concerned with a truly different, but also, you know, a vision that's not invested in. Not merely, it's virtue is not merely otherness. It's virtue is something internal, something substantive. Um, so that's my critique of, 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 of some of those decolonial discourses, even though I learn from them. And what I'm proposing is that the ummah, an Islamic civilization, does not need to be defined against um, and only from within Islam, uh, within certain you know places, current countries, certain geographies, and therefore this idea, uh, right, that only um, while Halak is not a Muslim, for instance, and I draw on him, I talk to him, I disagree with him sometimes passionately, but I don't say, look, you're not an insider, and therefore your insights that are really poignant, right, um, and important to what I have said are not relevant. Talal Assad, for example, would not be possible without his education in, 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 in Britain. Thank you very much. Um, I, I did want to just make a reference. Someone's adhan went up. Uh, and uh, we're concluding at five, uh, 6.30 sharp, so inshallah you'll have a good time, according to the Hanafi Madhab, to pray your... Uh, <laughs> oops, sorry. Um, can I have the lady uh, there and then followed by the gentleman? Um, I was wondering if you could speak more with regards to ummatic responsibilities around the position of minority communities of interpretation within Islam, uh, such as Ahmadis or Ismailis or Shia communities. Thank you. 
So one of the problems that the omatics, any omatics discourse, and I don't mean to say that we can monopolize omatic, all omatic discourse, right? We, the purpose of the omatic institute is to, uh, to create possibilities for really indigenous omatic discourse to emerge. Um, and the problem of deep difference within the Ummah, that's one of the crucial problems that any serious omatic discourse must pose to itself. Um, any political system, any political theory, in fact, it, one might say the very definition of political theory is how could human beings live while dif- being different individuals, having different interests and different, uh, having differences, yet sharing resources, sharing certain goals, certain agreements to disagree. So that's very much the task of thematics. Right, uh, the gentleman in the back. That's right, and then, then that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, firstly. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm in, uh, in complete agreement with your idea behind the ummatics. But I have a, an issue with the term ummatics because ummatics denotes that Islam is for Muslims. And Islamic polity is for Muslims. But as you are aware that the first Islamic po- polity created by the Prophet wasalam, himself, so. the majority of his citizens were not Muslims. And the majority of the citizens of the first of the Islamic golden era, the Khair al Qurun, the best of generations, the vast majority for the first hundred, hundred plus years were not Muslims. And the vast majority of the last hundred plus years in the Ottoman state were not Muslims. So, and if you look in the Quran, you look into Islam, there are rules, ideas, philosophies for all peoples. We have rules and regi- uh, legislations for non-Muslims, and it appeals to all. So, it's, and this is one of the, the issues that the enemies of Islam, or enemies of, enemies of any theocratic ideal, pinpoint is how do you deal with those of other faiths? Then, how do you even deal with those of other opinions than those in in power? And th- that is something that Islam oversees because Islam is a universal ideal, universal message. And its state also is for pe- all people. So doesn't that term umatics sort of play into that um, mm. idea that Islam is only for Muslims and Islamic polity? How does it deal with those of other faiths? Ah, uh, very interesting question. I've ans- tried to answer some of, a part of that question in some of my writings that is available at the Maddox uh, uh, Institute. Um, um, for instance... The idea of citizenship that you refer to as a historian, it's a little bit, uh, if I, I might take that, take an exception. Um, you don't really have a notion of citizenship uh, in Islam, uh, or at least in historical Islam, which is not to say that this is not something that the Ummah must uh, or, or, uh, or cannot think of. But um, the, the gist of your objection I do accept that as a challenge, and I don't think that umatics that m- umatics means that people who believe they are the ones who are driven by, and they are the ones who uh, respond to the divine message, but their response does not does not need to be exclusionary. In other words, you cannot go to non-Muslims and say, respond to Quranic message. That would be, that would work, right? That would not be part of the Quran, Islam's way that you're talking about, of dealing with difference. Um, so the Ummah is defined by the Quranic mandate, uh, which is not to say that it needs to be exclusionary. I hope that makes sense. Um can I uh, ask Gihad to ask you a question? Should I just speak um, if you just give us a second for the mic. 
Um, after you have uh, the gentleman over there, and then Gilang, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is actually related to the question that was just asked now, um, and I'm, I hope it comes out coherent because I'm still thinking about it, um, because when you said um, ummatics is to um, politics is to the polis, um, it meant, you know, linking with what has just been said, um, where does um, territory, fi- because the polis is the territory where all of the activities take place. And if, if we think about ummatics, then there is no such territory. We're talking about Muslims where uh, living on territory where um, the master signifier or what, deter- what defines the political order is the nation state. Um, so politics needs to, to happen in place. It's, it's not, we can't just speak to individuals. Um, so how, where does territory figure in this, or, or how uh, can ummatics or, or um, a grappling with issues of Muslims as Muslims happen without this coming to terms with the, the placelessness of, of Muslims? As, like, there is no Muslim place. It's, right. it's in, 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 like, there's, the ummah has no place. There's no n- notion of, like, that islam or... Um, because if if we grapple with that, it, it it allows us to theorize or to come up with alternatives about okay, so how do we live with those who are not Muslim? And if such a place were to exist, for example, so where does that figure? I hope hope that makes sense. Yes. Okay, so there are a lot of questions packed in there, um, and, and they're very very good questions. I will give very brief responses as I think of them. But let me first step back a little bit and propose that umatics, this is a proposal for a discourse. A discourse doesn't need a territory. But a discourse may be about a territory. It may be critical of the master signifiers that exist. And it certainly is critical of the nation state which is not to say that only those belonging to the nation state to part- participate in it, nor does it mean that we need to be in a particular place or territory to participate in the discourse. Uh, in fact, I argue, let's say there is such a territory tomorrow and there is such a thing as a khalifa, uh, you will still need umatic discourse because you'll still need to hold that, re- that authority responsible you will still need discourse on how to hold that authority responsible, by what standards. So that's what Omatic's discourse is, right? Uh, now the question of, which are very good questions, of territory, for example. Um, to say that Omatic's is not defined by a territory doesn't mean the Omatic's is not concerned with a territory. For instance, the nation-state, the modern nation-state, starts with, as a matter of definition, with a territory. And then the people that happen to be there, they are turned, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly, sometimes through ideology and uh, and propaganda, sometimes through schooling, um, and sometimes uh, through other mechanisms, into a community. Right? So nation building is done uh, on the people that happen to be there. So you start with a territory and then create a community. Even if that community is not a natural community, people who belong to that community may have various religious authorities that they give their allegiance to outside that territory. And in its pure form, the nation state requires that that state must be the first and the most important allegiance. Now, in reality, um, the nation state has been a phenomenon in transience. It is not a thing that's, it's not a timeless thing. You know, it's not some kind of logical operator that just exists in our minds or uh, a, a real sort of solid thing that exists. But rather, the nation state is a set of arrangements that have been changing and transforming. Right, So 19th century nation state or even earlier 20th century was a very strange phenomenon because there were none. You didn't have nation states. We usually talk about nation states since Westphalia, you know, 1648. But nearly everything 
in 19th century and 20th century is an empire, either the central territory, right, or the periphery. So na- nation states don't really come into existence until the second, after the Second World War. And even after that, if anybody knows about the Cold War, you know that these are not sovereign states. So the idea of sovereignty, uh, as some scholars call it, disorganized hypocrisy. This is the title of Professor Stephen Krasner's book. Um, so nation state is complicated, right? Nation state is a... a now the question for me, uh, to, to reiterate my answer to your question, which is, what does the Maddox do about territory or with territory? We must engage with territory, right? There's no doubt about that. Uh, but territory is not what defines the Ummah. The Ummah is defined by a belief, by a set of commitments, and then it deals with the territory. It also has to deal with, just as the nation state defined by a territory, with people who do not fit into that territory, either because more people are moving in uh, or because of the community building, like nation building is not um, in step with the beliefs of the people anymore. Um, so that's, has, that's a well-known problem in political theory, that are, uh, in, in modern political theory. In the same way, in omatic theory, you're going to have to deal with the fact uh, that you don't have everyone uh, who believes in, who, who lives in the territory but doesn't believe in the, the central master signifiers of the ummah. Well, how did the Prophet deal with that? How did the Quran deal with that? How did Muslims deal with that throughout history? That becomes part of the discourse. Uh, and what I propose to do today, what I propose today is not that I have all the answers, but rather what are the terms in which we should start think, just thinking about the answers. Thank you very much. Um, the gentleman over here had a question, and then we'll go back. You mentioned the idea of emetics and the idea of um, discussion between the ummah. To what extent, I'm just thinking of it in terms of Venn diagram, is emetics then just a rehash of shura, or is shura a part of the larger discussion of emetics? Specific sort of question. And then a larger question, just to create analogies, because that seems to be what everyone's doing here. Um, there was a discussion of the, the term to self, right, being uh, a reality without a name, and now it being a name without a reality like that. Was you've termed umatics, but surely it's going on already. The, the the discussion of revival. I wanted you to talk about the positive stuff. You know, what, who's doing it right already? Who's doing the umatics without using the term? Could you sh- shed some light on that, please? All right, excellent. So, the first question of um, umatics. Uh, sorry, remind me the quest- first question again. Is shura. shura, right? Yeah. Uh, consultation. Uh, so is omatics the same as shura? I think you could, I mean, I, I think what you're pointing to is correct, but I will just make a semantic quibbling, which is that shura or consultation is a virtue. It's something that's not necessarily political. You can do shura at home. You ought to do shura at home. The prophet did shura at home. Um, and you could do shura about your business. So it's not necessarily a political term in Islam. It's just that because it's a virtue, one, a political ruler ought to have it as well. It's not an institution. Um, Umatics is something that's grounded in, perhaps one could say, a, a deeper, uh, deeper, uh, deeper questions uh, or, 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 or principles in, in Islam, whereby the authority uh, of the the, the divine mandate in the Quran is given to the Ummah. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best of communities raised, brought forth for humankind. It's not a person or a class or a family, at least not in the Sunni imagination. It is the Ummah that is given in the Quran. It's very clear it's the Ummah that is given that mandate. Um, even if that ummah may ultimately be led by a person or uh, an institution or a family and so on. So what I'm trying to point to with ummatics 
is that fact that it is the ummah and how the ummah then is run whether it's virtuously or not virtuously that would be the concern of ummatic discourse um, now who is doing it and what we're what what is already there i believe that or rather i should say that uh, i and my colleagues fellow scholars um, at Ummatics, share this belief that Ummah is already Ummatic, meaning that Muslims do already have strong sentiment for others, for other Muslims, naturally everywhere. But um, in, institutionally, we live in a world that n- does not allow expression of those beliefs, of those morals, those virtues. And so we kind of live in a world where uh, our, our virtues do, are not coherent. And um, it is identifying what are the defeaters, if you will, and negators of omatic sentiment and behavior and, uh, and, and, and virtues uh, that, um, that exist and how we can bring our institutional reality, our sociopolitical reality, in uh, more in congruence with, uh, perhaps one might say, the truly um, the umatic heart of the ummah. It's clear on the one hand that we are umatic. On the other hand, uh, look at Syrian refugees in Turkey, for instance. Well, on the one hand, it's beautiful that so many refugees, right, are accepted in Turkey. Uh, Europe had to do a little bit of um, strong arming of, uh, uh, of, of, of of Turkish government for that. Nevertheless. Um, uh, there is a nationalist reaction against Syrians, right? The point is that that sentiment, when, when it's not institutionally backed, right, and when, it's com- and it, when there is competition with other uh, nationalistic, ethnic, other discourses, uh, then it doesn't go very far. So, Asa... And then, uh, then, uh, sorry, Ida. Ida is okay if you come after. I think that's going to have to be our final one. So, Asa, please. Assalamualaikum, Doctor Anjum, and uh, thank you for the um, wide-ranging and very stimulating presentation. Um, I was just wondering, going back to your point about thinking, the, the importance and necessity of thinking as a Muslim and the, the, the sense of continuity and and um, um, being, uh, thinking through your own categories and framework. And I'm just wondering to, to what, in what ways does your own project um, draw on those resources or in what ways is, uh, does it kind of situate itself within that framework and that, that tradition um, with, with kind of specific, uh, maybe some concrete or specific examples. And, and in, you know, are there any, um, is there a degree to which it also has had to, uh, your own thinking and your own conception, has it had to draw on, say, um, and, and I'm, I guess it has given your own training on Western political concepts, and do you find those to be in tension somehow? And do you find there to be, um, yeah, I mean, are the intention and how have you kind of dealt with that, um, given given the importance and necessity in your own articulation of thinking as a Muslim and thinking through our own categories? Thank you. Okay, so it's a brilliant question, and I would say there's no easy way to answer it in theory. It, the proof has to be in the pudding. Um, and I suspect uh, Professor Osama al-Azami does not have time for me to do the pudding uh, but 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 in short um, I have an article for instance who wants the caliphate uh, 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 which is available at Yakin Institute but also at Omatics uh, 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 Institute uh, website where I only suggest how what, what we might start thinking about it and which is not to say I'm the first person to think about it I'm very much aware that many, many Muslims have thought about uh, about it. 
um, which is in fact what gives me hope and strength. Um, but at the same time, there is a howling silence in many important and most important circles uh, of the Ummah. So you, you talk to an ordinary Muslim in the world, um, they may be completely in agreement with the general framework of thinking about other Muslims without excluding non-Muslims. Yet at the same time, there is no institutional, there is no academic, there is no uh, representa- inst- you know, representation of in, in the world. So that's sort of... Uh, now, how do I bring in Islamic tradition? Uh, first of all, let me correct uh, one suggestion, which you didn't make explicitly, but I want to correct it anyway. Uh, when I say that we must think in terms of our own resources, it's not the same kind of thing as many neo-traditionalists make, which is that one must think, one must, uh, and even neo-traditionalists, a term I'm, I'm using very broadly, the idea that we must find one Islamic justification in some book of fiqh for everything we do. But rather what I mean to, I, I, and, and, and I pointed to, I think uh, very sincerely, even though it sounded like I'm saying two different things, it's really not possible for us to extricate ourselves from what we call the West. Because not everything that has happened in the West is normatively anti-Islamic. And therefore, engaging with the West, including writing and speaking in English, is possible. And precisely because it's possible... And I I argue for it for deeper reasons. I think that Islamic and Western heritages are connected, right? It's it's both Abrahamic tradition, the Greek tradition, both of them in many ways have been central to, you know, both the the twin traditions of the West and and Islam. And so in some respect, you'll find that conversation with Western formation uh, and and with the West is is easier... um, in terms of our basic references, right, and our, our linguistic resources, than it would be if you were to talk, for instance, to Chinese or Indian uh, heritage, which is not to say one ought not to do that, but simply that um, you can't really do Qur'an without dealing with Western heritage. You cannot do tafsir, um, meaning... You have to know, right, what the Bible said. So much of the Quran is argument and engagement with the Bible. Um, And similarly, much of medieval Islamic tradition, classical Islamic tradition, is wrestling with Greek tradition in the same way that uh, the Western tradition did. Which is not to say uh, that there isn't distinctiveness of Islamic tradition, but that one should, that, that it's not disengagement that I'm proposing. Not that you implied that. Um, But that said, I think uh, in my writings, in my books, um, I engage in my way of how I would do it. This would be my contribution to the umatic discourse, which is not to say that it has to be everybody's in that way, right? So every... uh, what does define the Ummah, in my view, it are, of course, certain references, certain signifiers that are central. Um, in Islamic heritage, what is known and agreed upon, those are things, even though they can be disagreed on themselves, um, but there is a historical reality, there is historical consensus. Um, one may even challenge aspects of that consensus, but one has to do that within the resources of that tradition, all right? So in that sense, what I'm saying is perhaps similar to what Alistair McIntyre would say, that in order for a tradition to be coherent, so he says two things. One, the traditions grow only by encountering other traditions or encountering differences and resolving differences within themselves, right? So difference and conflict and, 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 and uh, encounter with the outsider is often central to the development of traditions, On the other hand, if a tradition is not able to respond to fundamental questions in its own resources, then it no longer can meaningfully be said to to continue. Then you may still 
you know, um, I, as I said, you may still like the cuisine, you may like kufi, you know, some sartorial gestures. Those are all important. Those are all part of Islamic tradition. But those are things that can be easily picked up. They don't necessarily mean there is a continuity if those choices cannot be justified from within the tradition. Does that make sense? A little bit? Thank you. That will be the last question, if that's all right. So, um, Aida, Gilang, and the lady in the back. Um, should I take them individually still? Okay, I'll, I'll continue in that vein, sure. if that's all right. Uh, Aida, and then... Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, quite, I'm not very articulate in terms of expressing some... I have, I have two questions. First is around... You mentioned, I think Dr. Abdul Hakim Murad talks in his books, talks a lot about this Abrahamic root of, of our tradition and therefore this erosion of culture and language and, and so forth, not being limited to Islam, but also by extension to other people of faith and communities within the West. And whilst on the one hand you, there is this erosion, there's also a revival of spirituality, whether or not that's marked with kind of those, those, original, tr- those original faith traditions. So the West is seeing that increasing emergence. So I guess my first question is, what room is there for us to capitalise and build alliances with with other faith communities that are going through a similar struggle? And the second thing is around, um, you mentioned when you were speaking about um, us Muslims, many of us, myself included, being a lot more focused on the form of Islam, whether that's hijab, prayer and so forth, rather than the purpose of Islam. But does that not mean that there are levels to umatics in the sense of, what if it's okay to just be as a Muslim, um, if that is the best that an individual can be? Because that survival, I would say, is also an essential part of, of our tradition and um, learning from the earlier Muslims and how, how they too survived and accepted that, that sense of being. So I guess is this idea of ihsan, in other words, like applicable to... I'm rambling, I'm going to stop there, but I think you... Yeah, I don't know what I'm saying anymore, apologies, but yeah, I, yeah. Does okay. that make sense? Or no, that? you rambled beautifully. Okay. Uh, I don't really have a response because you said both things correctly. First, uh, umatics uh, is not just about some kind of political planning, you know, like planning for a coup. It's really very much of how we live. Um, and this includes lullabies that you tell, you know, that you sing to your babies. Um in other words, a matrix and mode of existence, something that shouldn't be reduced to, which is, doesn't mean it's exclusive of political, but being political, uh, you know, you know I, I grew up with lullabies about Palestine. That was, to me, more powerful um, than any book on theology I read or political theology. Um, and... The question of interfaith, if you will, is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to reduce what the complex and rich question you had. I think that you are right that um, interfaith alliances um, are, are important. In fact, if you, if you have time or interest on, um, uh, I had a dialogue with a Christian theologian recently um, for a podcast. It's called Zealots at the Gate, I believe. Um, um, Professor Shadi Hamid and Matthew, now I'm going to butcher his name, Kamink, I believe, who is, a prof- who is a professor at Fordham University, a, a Christian theologian, about thematics, because I think there is, of course, as much to share. At the same time, people of faith do have certain line spots and people, uh, not, people who are not people of faith, there also there is room to, you know, uh, to make alliances with them, uh, so I'm not, I'm not precluding those as well. But you're absolutely right; there is a lot more in common, and the Quran establishes that commonality by uh, honoring the people of the book with, as people of the book. Uh, but um, the erosion that's taking place—I'm afraid it's it's so fast that sometimes people of the book are not good allies. I'd like to conclude by really thanking uh, Professor Rehmer Anjum, and I think he, uh, we owe him a round of applause. Um.
And I also want to highlight that if, if you're interested, there is a um, sort of brief outline of the umatics on a single sheet of paper. Um, we don't have unlimited copies, but you can get all of this information also on umatics.org. Right. If I may interject. Please, yes. Please. I want to apologize for being curt and sometimes cavalier with my responses. I had to stick to the time. But I will say the question you ask of what we can do is the most important question that we are concerned with at Umatics Institute. So uh, that's precisely what we're trying to answer. Uh, you'll find that in our various lectures, we have monthly colloquia where we have people from all different uh, walks of life and different uh, places, um, scholars from different uh, backgrounds, uh, both in terms of denominational backgrounds from different regions, different areas, uh, speak about thematics. So if you're interested, uh, please sign up. And uh, as we are ex- uh, expanding and exploring those possibilities, um, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, from something as simple, perhaps not simple, and powerful as writing poetry or lullabies to um, thinking about institutional design, I think that uh, everyone has... Uh, a, a role to play that sounded cheesy, but really we do mean it. Um, so there it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. And again, thank you again, uh, Professor Omer uh, It's really, um, you heard it here first, right? I mean, this is, um, I think, really a privilege for us to be the first place, uh, first academic institution in the UK that has actually hosted you to talk about the Omatics Institute. I would like to just remind folks, uh, those of you who did ask questions, we'd really be grateful if you came and just filled in a form. Um, you just need to put your name and sign, sign your life away to us so that we can, inshallah, um, put this up on our YouTube page, inshallah. Um, and uh, besides that, um, really... Uh, I'm grateful for your attendance. You're asking very thoughtful questions of our speaker. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in future events. But please, um, uh, for the, uh, you know, if you're a regular at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, you can sign up to our mailing list um, through our website. But I'd also like to highlight the importance of Umatics as a project. I think it's precisely the sorts of people in this room uh, who are, discursively engaging uh, already with so many of these sorts of themes that um, I think would be a great addition to um, the conversation at Ummatics. And I look forward to participating myself as you've kindly invited. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.